morning, everyone. It's uh, March 6th, uh, Board of Selectmen Budget Workshop. We'll call the meeting to order, and I uh, invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, flag, to the United, United States, States of America, of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, and liberty and justice for all. In with uh, public audience, and uh, we've invited people to send uh, written correspondence to Erica Butler, ebutler at simsbury-ct.gov, and also uh, to join the meetings uh, in person, um, you can send an email to Tom Fitzgerald, tfitzgerald at simsbury-ct.gov uh, to register in advance. And we'll begin with some written comment that uh, Sean will read. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, so this first one is uh, from Rachel Wellman, a member of the uh, Culture Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, to the Board of Selectmen, as a member of the Simsbury Culture Parks and Rec Commission, I'm ready to advocate for the inclusion of a facility maintenance technician in the town's budget, along with the staff training and professional development required to support our park staff. The Parks and Open Space Master Plan recommended the addition of this position, along with others, based on the many parks, areas of open space, and facilities that have been added in Simsbury. This creates more... Audrey, you're not part of public comment. <laughs> this creates more responsibilities and stretches our current staff. I would also like to reiterate my support for the purchase of Meadowwood. Purchasing the Meadowwood parcel is important to preserving Simsbury's rich history of agriculture and our beautiful pastoral landscape. The project benefits many of our residents, including advocates of historical preservation, local athletes, environmental advocates, and the residents who enjoy passive recreation. I hope that the town does not pass by this opportunity to purchase this parcel of land. Sincerely, Rachel Wellman, Culture Parks and Rec Commission. And we have one more email that also came from uh, a member of Culture Parks and Rec, uh, Kelly Kearney. Uh, thank you to all of our town officials for their hard work each and every year on crafting a budget. I can only imagine the multiple challenges that you all must face, kudos. I especially would like to thank all the elected officials, volunteers who give their time and talents. All of you are appreciated for what you do to make Sims very great. Regarding this year's budget choices, you are obviously faced with difficult choices. With that in mind, I ask that you not sacrifice Simsbury's multiple strengths and highlights, and that you weigh your choices and tie them back to what makes Simsbury special. Our town's strengths are clearly education, recreation, and character. Character referring to architecture, buildings, parks, small town feel. Without those, Simsbury loses its true, unique, and special qualities. Underfunding, in some cases chronic underfunding, does the townspeople a disservice. While we all want to keep our taxes low, we also must maintain our unique and special qualities or risk lowering our property values and losing that character. That would be an outcome that would far outweigh taxes that are slightly higher. Please make choices that maintain Simsbury's unique qualities and that fund important recreation items, such as the additional employee position, which is critical, golf course irrigation, which is mission critical and cannot be delayed or it risks a catastrophic course shutdown, training and development, and other deferred parks maintenance that will certainly adversely affect the quality of the parks that are so important to our town. Thank you again for all that you do. We appreciate it. And in the long run, these hard choices, if correctly made, will benefit all of Simsbury positively. Avoiding them or underfunding them will have a large negative impact, which will be far more costly than the incremental taxes ever would be. Kelly Kearney. And we also have uh, some uh, members of the public who have joined um, this meeting. Um, who would like to go first? No, well, I'd be happy to go first. Okay, great, Mark. Hi. My name is Mark Orenstein, and I've lived at 82 Old Meadow Plain Road in Weetog for almost 50 years. I moved into town in my mid-20s, and I am now in my mid-70s. I love Simsbury, and since the mid-1990s, I've been a member of several town commissions, boards, and task forces, as well as technically supporting several nonprofits in town. Until the end of this last year, I had been on the Aging and Disability Commission for either 10 or 12 years. I just cannot remember. Among you, I believe that only Mike and Sean have been on the Board of Selectmen long enough to remember the ups and downs and the spiralings of the Senior Center effort now the Senior Community Center. 
I want to read to you a couple of excerpts from minutes of the Senior Center slash Eno Memorial Subcommittee meeting in February of 2014. 2014. And Mike, you attended the meeting. Ms. Diane Nash stated that the subject of a new senior center has been studied for almost 40, 40 years. And after going through many years of notes, cannot figure out why it has taken this long. She stated that she is frustrated over the many hours people have spent on this issue and that the parameters have never been clearly set. Mr. Bud Kelly, who is a member of the Building Commission, stated that the new senior center has been played around with for over three years. This included making trips to various locations to look at other senior centers to get ideas of what the seniors of Simsbury would like to do. Let me emphasize that this meeting was three years into the then most recent discussions about the senior center. Over 10 years have now gone by since these discussions started. 10 years. The town has been through two sets of architects as well as a senior center programming consultant brought in when Lisa Hefner was first selectman. To me, the fiscal year 26-27 date for the senior center is a real disservice, if not an insult, to the senior population of town. I actually believe that with this state, I can give up that a proper senior community center will ever happen, at least in my lifetime. I urge the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance to rearrange the capital plan to move the Senior Community Center to an earlier date. I've personally decided to vote no to all future capital projects until the Senior Community Center comes up for a capital referendum vote. And let me tell you, about 15 months ago, I was the SCT cameraman for a Board of Education meeting at Latimer Lane School, and I went on a tour of the school. It really needs to be the first item to be addressed, but I will vote no for it. As you can probably tell, I have become embittered. I just wonder how many other senior citizens in this town have similar feelings. Thank you. Mark, thank you. And um, I hope you've been well. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. Um, is there anybody else uh, who is here to speak in public audience? Hey, Eric. Okay. Eric. Uh, Jackie? I just wanted to make, if I could, just make a, a really quick statement um, before we get into the budget overview. Yeah, I just, sure. I just wanted to thank Maria and her staff for navigating um, our town through this past year. I probably don't even know half of the adjustments that had to be made. And I just appreciate the time and effort that you guys did. And I feel like you really made it look easy. Um, and then just on um, on the budget, I wanted to just let people know that it looks like as of January, we had 654 people that were unemployed, our residents in town. And then we had um, 31 tax waivers. So just keeping that in mind, um, like Maria had said, I think in her overview, I'm for maintaining services, but I, I don't think this is the time or the year that we should be doing increases. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jackie. And I would echo her comments around around our incredible town staff. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so we'll, we'll go on to uh, on the agenda, um, starting with revenues and budgeting assumptions. And Maria, should I turn that over to you? Yes, yes. And Jackie, thank you so much. I really appreciate the kind words about myself and staff. Everybody worked so hard this past year and um, had to be creative and, and adapt. Um, but thank you. Thank you. And I mean, we were just so fortunate to have an incredibly supportive board. You all have just been wonderful and um, we really appreciate the support. Thank you. All right, I'm just if you give me one moment, I'm gonna pull up the slides. Great, all right, sorry about that, let me. Wonderful. All right. Can everyone see that? Okay. Excellent. Very good. Well, good morning. Thank you. We're going to jump right in um, to do a quick overview of our revenues and, and budgeting assumptions. And then I'll be turning it over to, uh, to Mike, who has some training um, going on later today. So he's going to be up first on the expenditure uh, portion of the discussion. 
So again, just a very quick uh, recap of our grand list growth. Um, we are expecting uh, under the certified grand list, a grand list increase of about 2.93%. I'm estimating that will generate about 2.7 million in new revenue. Um, you know, had received some questions in terms of what were some of the drivers for the new growth for real estate, um, some of the construction of our, our newer apartment complexes, such as the Ridge of Talcott Mountain, um, our new big Y was substantially complete. Um, so those are a couple of, of the key drivers there. And for personal property, um, you know, we had the completion of the Tobacco Valley Solar Project, as well as the Cure Leaf expansion that added a considerable amount of personal property. So while they're not all of the drivers, those are a couple of the key drivers in those areas of growth. And we were really fascinated um, by having two consecutive strong years of new growth in a row. So since I released the budget uh, about two weeks ago now, we went back at a staff level and expanded our analysis of the grand list to about 20 years. And so we took a look to see uh, what the certified grand list looked like in non-revaluation years. Um, and a, a chart that's coming up, you'll see revaluation years tend to be you know, pretty extreme outliers, either you know, a significant you know, amount of growth or maybe even a decrease in valuation. So we looked at about 16 years in which they were not revaluation years. And we found that a range of uh, certified grand list growth was around 0.79 to 0.85%. Um, so the last two years um, were actually the strongest years that we've had in the last 20 years outside of a revaluation year at 2.66 and 2.93%. And there was actually one, uh, only one other time, and that was 2005, where that number exceeded 2%, and that was 2.45%. So again, I think that just sort of helps tell that story of just how, how remarkable um, the last two years have been. And then again, we've been hearing questions about, okay, well, how is that, you know, how is that impacting the grand list? Many of our top 20 taxpayers are now on um, projects that have only been completed within the last three to five years. And so um, a few of the examples of some of the, the taxpayers that are in here are Tobacco Valley Solar, um, the Highcroft Complex, as that's had various, you know, phases of build out, Ridge at Hellcat Mountain, Anthology, Big Y, Aspen Green, Cure Leaf. So again, all examples of projects that are relatively recent, um, but those folks have now become our top, top 20 taxpayers. And here's just a visualization for you, again, with us expanding the analysis and the grand list growth to 20 years. So I don't know, folks, can folks see my cursor if I do this? Oh, perfect. So this green line represents the average new growth that we've experienced outside of revaluation years. These black dots, those represent revaluation years. So those are our outlier years. And then you can see here is the um, upcoming and current and how much above the average that's been. And then going back even another year prior, we, we hit the average. So we've had some really, you know, really uh, decent years of new growth the last few years. And I think as you'll hear Mike's presentation uh, in just a few minutes, you'll see that, you know, there's a very good chance that I think we can anticipate some reasonable new growth in, in the out years coming up. So just a couple of other quick uh, revenue assumptions. Um, as a reminder, we did use the collection rate of 98.5% for budgeting purposes. Um, we are seeing that our tax revenues are, are remaining stable despite the pandemic environment. We did adjust a small amount of our local revenues appropriately based on trends and historical analysis. Um, I know I covered these two weeks ago, but if anybody has you know, specific questions on conveyance tax, land recording fees, building permit fees, our interest income or rental income, we're happy to take questions on those. And you'll recall, we went over a couple of our state budgeting assumptions. Uh, we left our state revenues flat for budgeting purpose, uh, purposes. And the potential for state or federal um, pandemic relief funds does uh, remain uncertain at this time. We are following what's, what's occurring. Um, one very uh, preliminary estimate we saw, which um, was quite surprising, uh, was that we may receive as much as uh, $2.5 million under this next round of funding. Um, again, that's such a large number. It's not set in stone. The legislation isn't officially passed. So yeah, I would sort of take that with a grain of salt at this point, but we are doing our best to monitor and, and, and try to determine what we may see um, for some of those relief funds coming to the town, hopefully later this spring. 
And again, just a quick snapshot um, and that the bulk of our revenues will be coming through our property taxes. Any questions on revenues before we jump into Mike's presentation? All right, great, thank you. All right, we will turn this over to Mike. Good morning. Sorry about that. Uh, I have a Connecticut Bar Association. It's our uh, biannual meeting, uh, continuing education going on at the same time here. So I have two Zoom meetings going at once. But let me, um, I'll access my presentation now. Good morning. So I'll just briefly go through this. And as Maria said, we'll hit sort of the little picture of what's going on too. Um, overall, uh, for my department, it's a 0 0.07 increase, uh, basically $453. We really looked at a lot of our line items and trying to find out ways that, um, you know, based on what we've been you, uh, spending in years past, along with what we need, uh, you know, for example, uh, a lot of the staff members in my department um, we have continuing education requirements for the various licenses and des de in professional designations that we possess. Um, so this, this budget is really just a real responsible attempt to, to this is what we need to maintain our services and our certifications. Um, as you can see, the planning department, it's actually about a 1.19 uh, decrease. Uh, building, it's a 1.7 increase. Um, there's no change in if staffing levels for either department. Um, and really uh, one of the driving factors for the increase for the building department is due to uh, salaries for full-time uh, staff, just uh, negotiated uh, contractual step increases. So um, some of the areas of focus, as you know, we, we just finished phase one of the comprehensive rewrite of the zoning regulations with the zoning commission. We're moving on to other phases. For example, right now staff is working with the commission on looking at our industrial zoning zones and looking in ways to add uses potentially to our industrial zoning reg uh, districts. Uh, we have about 200,000 square feet of vacant office space that may not be office space in the future. So we're looking at ways to add uses that are co compatible with the co existing uh, development patterns, but at the same time, uh, kind of position ourselves where we have some interesting reinvestment. Um, another thing is, uh, courtesy of COVID, this was a project that we were started last year, but was put on pause. And we're looking to update a lot of our uh, guides, et cetera, that we hand out to the public, kind of outlining the land use process. Um, and of course, one thing we're, we're advancing, uh, the POCDs, economic development priorities, reviewing land use pro, uh, process and regulations. As I said earlier, example could be the industrial zoning regulations because um, one thing we've heard is our, our industrial zones are limited in uses. And like I said earlier, we have a lot of vacant space that, need, that really needs to be filled. Um, and we continue with working with the town manager's office on uh, business visitation and other uh, functions with the EDC. Um, I kind of hit on it on the last slide. Um, the, the really the developing a, a user-friendly process has been a key um, of what we've been trying to do. Um, the next phase, I mean, we really did a great job of reorganizing those zoning regulations is uh, finalizing a handbook that's kind of outlined. So what, it, what do you have to do if you want to open a business? What do you want to do if you want to add an addition to your house? Um, at least this way, what we're feeling is we're is making it so that one, the process is known. So people say, I understand how to navigate through the commission or the regulatory process, but more importantly, um, it just, it's, it's a better sharing of information. Um, the last one is just, I, I know I did my public service announcement last year, but this year is gonna be a little more urgent. Um, we're expecting the draft maps sometime this year in 2021, but um, also I wanna give you a heads up that this fall, anyone who has a uh, policy of the National Flood Insurance Program, I just found this out yesterday, will be receiving an increase to their policy. 
So it, it's, it's a focus to make sure that, that people that are affected by these changes uh, know what's going on and know that you know, they have uh, staff members in the planning department that could assist in technical questions, either regarding uh, just what it, what's the National Flood Insurance Program status, or more importantly, uh, the new mapping project that's coming. So, so one of the areas of focus, we're gonna talk about some of the commercial projects that are going on in town. These are new, well, one is McLean, which is approved, which has been uh, under construction. They're moving along nicely. They were a little delayed courtesy of COVID. However, they're proceeding. Um, it's an 18 month construction uh, project. They, they were delayed. They should have started last spring. They, unfortunately, the project did not start until about the end of July, early August of last year. So it pushed it back. Ensign Bickford has approached the uh, building department on, on uh, building plans for phase two. So I think that's a, that's a positive thing to say that they're, they're looking to move on to the later phases that they kind of indicated when they first came to the um, uh, Board of Selectmen when they asked for their uh, business incentive uh, or tax abatement. Andy's Plaza and the facade updates and tenant improvements. I can report this to this group that as of yesterday, we received the building permit. So I've been saying that this is coming this spring. It's real. Um, th that The picture on the bottom right corner is kind of what the facelift, the facelift is going to look like when they're done for the Andy's Plaza. Um, the building permit also was for some changes in the interior layout of the of the uh, structure. So they're accommodating potentially new um, tenants uh, that may be coming there. The last one is the Route 44 Albany Turnpike, the electric car dealership. Um, obviously, uh, permits were approved in Simsbury back in October. We're waiting to see how this how this shakes out in Canton. Uh, they have a public hearing that's that's ongoing. Um, and the results of their public hearing could determine uh, possibly changes to the layout of this development. So that's something to stay tuned to because right now the, the proposed structure for the electric car dealership, only a portion of it's in Simsbury. If things can, if, if, if for some reason they can't secure their permits in Canton, we may see a change in that layout and Simsbury could benefit by having that structure not partially located in Simsbury, but entirely located in Simsbury. So that's just another uh, little commercial project. The others, you know, there's there's talk about a redevelopment of the bowling alley. Um, we're, we're, we're anticipating that we may be seeing um, applications that we can, we can discuss more publicly in the near future, along with, we've had some interest over at, um, at Simsbury Commons on some uh, new tenant fit outs, which is kind of exciting. So it shows from a commercial standpoint, there's a lot of ongoing projects in town. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. Hey, Mike, I know you have to go. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. You did also a tremendous job this year, keeping our businesses open, um, especially the outdoor dining. And I know you worked with Henry and Simsbury Main Street, and I just really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, we didn't. I didn't put that in in our budget narrative, but um, we we inherited a lot of the sector enforcement that was above and beyond the um, health district's responsibilities under the pandemic. So everything between outdoor dining to questions on how I can operate my business in in um, this environment, uh, clarifications on sector rules or or enforcement, as as, as some of you know. We've, we've provided some updates on some of the enforcement cases, yet we inherited all that on top of our regular job of dealing with development and, and everything. And, and you're right, um, it's, it was a fantastic partnership with Sarah Nielsen, the Main Street Partnership, and also with, you really gotta give a shout out to your health district and uh, Jason Brown and Jennifer, they've just been tremendous to work with the, uh, on this. Um, and I'll get into the next slide. So. We wanted to talk about a few of the res just a, a few highlights of the residential developments that are occurring in town. The Ridge at Talcott Mountain, 216 on 299 units have been approved. 144 certificate of occupancies have been issued, and they're still building over there. Um, Highcroft, the second phase, which that's the plans in the lower right hand corner of this slide, it calls for 48 townhouses, 36, uh, all of them have been permitted at this point, and 36 certificate of occupancies have been issued. 
the last one is Cambridge Crossing, which is the uh, picture that's on the top right corner of this slide. Um, it's a 79 uh, single family homes. 25 of those homes have been permitted. 19 certificate of occupancies have been issued to date. And they're still kind of work picking away at this, this development. Both, all these show that like, nothing's been on hold. They're, they're still proceeding in these projects, which is, like I said, it, it's, it's really nice to see. And, and, and you'll see in the next slide, there's other things that are on the horizon that have been before the commission's um, preliminary that are real. Um, for example, um, so here's some of the new the stuff we've been we're engaged with and you know pretty active. That picture there, that's the latest and greatest um, development plans for the Simscroft redevelopment, Simscroft Echo Farms on Iron Horse Boulevard. It was presented to the Design Review Board uh, on uh, this past Monday. Um, and a lot of the changes that occurred, they pushed the buildings back, they provided some greenscape in front, and they kind of redesigned the buildings. Um, it was uh, very well received by design review, and, and we, we, this is moving forward. Um, they're working on getting their plans together to start see, to going to the uh, land use commissions. That was a proposal for 170 uh, residential units downtown with an affordability component to it. Um, which is, it's, it's really nice to see and it's exciting. That's gonna be you know, a, a great project for the center of town. Um, I have here the Hurley property, which is the uh, Foster's ice cream um, property. Back in August, uh, uh, John Ritson, who's now the new uh, property owner for, the, for this parcel, uh, came before the design review board with a potential uh, redevelopment plan for a mixed use development. Design review has asked that they asked, they asked for some changes to the plan, um, you know, and as I said, there was preliminary, he has been working on it. And, you know, as of yesterday, he's been in contact with my office about, you know, what's my next steps. So that's another one where it's, here comes some of that development, uh, more residential, but also mixed use in that sense. And the last one is, um, there's been interest on, in the powder forest on the commercial parcel out front. Uh, first, it was a hotel, then it was a medical use. Um, but still, I mean, it just shows people are still coming through our doors. They're still very interested to invest in this community. And from like, from a local, local economy perspective, you know, we're doing, we're doing better than most. Um, and as, as kind of Maria hinted about the growth that she experienced in the past years, I mean, this is, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice thing that we're having and we're not, you know, we're still, the commissions are still adhering to the to the regs and, and, and trying to balance the the impacts of development. And I think that is it for my slides. So uh, Hi, thank you. Are there are there questions? Great. Mike, I wish you um, good professional development today. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Okay, we'll move on to uh, town clerk. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, Erica. <laughs> Good to Long see everybody. To see. I know, right? <laughs> um, well, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, yeah, let's get started. I think mine will probably be the easiest of the day. So this will just keep the ball rolling. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So our operating budget proposed is 243,748, which is a 1.5% increase um, or about $3,500. And um, we have three budgeted full-time employees in our office. Um, areas of focus, um, this, this first one is one that, you know, is always my focus every year we do this. Um, we don't wanna miss out on these funds. These are funds that we hand over to the state when we do our recording and it's important to get what we can back. Um, so we are eligible for $7,500, which we have been for the past couple of years, which is great. Um, you can do quite a bit when it comes to preservation work in, in the town clerk's office but it, with $7,500. Um, this year, actually within the, the next couple of weeks, I'll be submitting my application for the Board of Selectmen to um, you know approve of. I plan on... Um, you know, this past year has taught us a lot, right? So uh, we had back to 1976 on our um, <clears throat> land record index, which is available online to the public, um, including indexing and imaging. 
this is great. It's over 40 years. It has been extremely useful this past year um, and has been utilized greatly. Um, the key now is, you know, I wasn't planning on going back further than 40 years because we don't have the indexing for it. So we'd be paying for indexing and imaging, um, which is quite costly. But I did look into a different avenue, um, which would be digitizing just the indexes and the indexes as a whole. So you wouldn't be indexing each individual document, but those would be digitized. And then the image, once you know the volume and page would be available. Um, so I think this is what I plan on doing for this year. Um, I think it will be great. It will, you know, we did find that there were people that needed documents further back than the 40 years. Um, and we've been handling that through the past year. Um, but I think, you know, this is something now that I've decided is worth the expense. Um, and it's more affordable than actually having each individual document indexed. Um, one of my ongoing, <laughs> ongoing um, goals is to organize the records on our existing and um, newly installed high capacity shelving units. And we just recently finished, actually just yesterday, um, finished re renovations in our vault. Um, I wish you all could see it. <laughs> uh, looks fabulous. Um, we had the, the floors done, so the carpet is gone. Um, so we have um, like manufactured tile in there, which looks great. Um, it's painted. We have more of the high density shelving put in, um, increased lighting, um, you know, improved lighting. It's so much brighter in there. Uh, it's, it's a place you'd actually want to go to do research now. Um, my goal is to make it look as professional as possible. Um, and just to, to make it work the, the, the most efficient that it can. Um, so that's our continued goal. Um, and then the last one there, um, I, I thought we would have been using this already, but with the delays over the past year, um, the, the electronic death registry system is now in, um, they did a pilot in New London, it spread through New London County, and now it's in New Haven, I believe. So by summertime, hopefully, um, all Connecticut towns uh, will have access to this. So I'm, I'm excited for that. It's a great improvement for Connecticut. Um, we're behind on that, you know, our low, you know, neighboring states have it, Massachusetts already uses it, um, a, a, not the same one, but a form of it, and um, it's going to streamline a lot of things for us. Um, budget highlights, <laughs> this is easy, a $4,100 increase, which is um, due just to the full-time salaries to anticipate a general wage increase and in negotiations um, for our contractual steps. So that's, that's really it. Um, as far as the registrar of voters, um, they have a decrease. Their proposed budget is 132,100, um, a decrease in about 25,000. This is due to the, the fewer elections. Um, we're only looking at a budget referendum this year and the municipal election, thank goodness. <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, I, I think we are not ready for a presidential election I wish we had more than four years until the next one, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, that's it. Any questions? Well, Eric, I, I did want to take a moment and acknowledge the unprecedented work of uh, your team uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, you know, yeah. October and early November. Unbelievable. Thank you. And you know what? So, you know, it's like when everything hits, it hits all at once. Um, our land records have been insane. I mean, especially for this time of year. Um, I have not seen this volume consistently daily. Well, definitely not here since I've been here for five years. I mean, this is just, it's crazy. It's, it's, and um, so with that and the election, um, somehow we got through it. And I know that if we can get through that, honestly, we can get through anything. Um, so I'm excited. I have a new team member that started just a couple weeks ago. Um, and, you know, I'm just excited to move forward and, to take on whatever challenges come our way. I, I'm sure there'll be more. <laughs> Erica, thank you. What, what questions are there? Eric, I, uh, this is Sean, I have one. Erica, Hi, Sean. Uh, hey, respects the, uh, the, the presidential, obviously a, a tough time, but we're, we're embarking, it seems like on a, on a new age of voting in this town, yeah. in the state and in this country. What do you see coming down the pipe from a capital standpoint, a technological need? Anything yeah. that we should start thinking about? Well, it's funny because they, you know, they're still throwing this early voting versus no excuse absentee voting. Um, yep. And, you know, 
it could go two different ways. You know, it could, I, I believe, um, you know, ROVAC, the, 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 the registrar's association, they actually are thinking they're promoting, taking it, taking it over, but um, the, the town clerks association, you know, it's not, we don't want to have to hand it over. It's not that we want to hand over absentee balloting. I think it just, I think early voting is probably what our association is going to take the stance on that makes the most sense because um, just for staffing reasons, right? So, and I, I really do think it'll probably be on the 2022 um, state election ballot, the question, okay. I, I, I see it coming. Um, I, I know like, you know, Karen, you know, our, our, the, the equipment the state uses is, is old <laughs> and out of date. And I imagine if we turn over to early voting um, that a, the type of equipment used will change. Yep. Um, and it, I can't imagine they'll continue to use the outdated stuff that we have. So right. um, I think it's probably something to keep your eye on for sure. I mean, it's, it, this has definitely changed it. Of course, you know, we were headed that way. Right. Um, but with this past election, that kind of just, I think, tipped it over the edge. So whether it's no excuse for early voting, whatever you want to call it, um, I, I can see that for the future for sure. Okay. So just in thinking about it it, it, it might come in a technology need. It might come in a staffing need. We, we're not quite sure yet. But so Exactly. <clears throat> and I will keep you up to date with that. We um, okay. just recently started talking about it in our Hartford County meetings. Okay. Um, and it's something we're going to continue to talk about because there's so many different ways it could look. Um, but we as town clerks need to be prepared for whatever that might be. Um, you know, staffing is definitely, you know, an issue. I mean, we can't you know, towns can't handle that amount of absentee ballots without having additional staff. It's whether the, the state is going to provide some type of guidance and, you know, it'd be a great to have like an elections division where there's set staff for that. Um, but we know that the state will probably put something forward and leave it in our hands to then figure it out. Um, and we will, you know, we will, we do, um, right. but yeah, I would definitely keep it top of mind and I will, um, you know, any updates I get along the way, I'll be sure to share with you. Yeah. I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, from a staffing standpoint, you know, we have a lot, we have a great, um, you know, election day force that the registrars work with to get in the moderators, right. And the assistant moderators and all those folks. I wonder if it'll just be a longer season with those folks. And, and it, it may be, to, yeah. Know, if, if we do yeah. early voting. Yep. Yep. So I guess what I'm going at is, is again, it's a $25,000 increase, decrease, excuse me, in the registrar voter budget, but we really shouldn't, we shouldn't look at that as right permanent. That's going to come back up to, to level funding where we are today, either in two years or four years, and it may exceed that. So more for, you know, obviously I know Maria, you and, and Amy have your eye on this, but um, you know, is that an, is that a place where I, again, it, it gets put over in a, in a, in a temporary you know, capital fund or something earmarked for registrar or voters expenses so that we can earn it back in. And it's not a massive hit to the budget in a couple of years. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the only reason to bring it up. That's a good point. Um, yeah, Tara, whether it's my office or their office, I imagine that the, the funds will be needed at some point. Yeah. This, this savings is very temporary is what I'm assuming. Right. So. Right. Okay. Mike? Thanks. Um, yeah. I wanted to, uh, I was going to ask the question that Sean did, but uh, also commend your, your your office for stepping into the breach, both the COVID one and uh, the assistance with the uh, election last fall. Uh, you and your folks, current and past, were <laughs> phenomenal. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we take pride. That's for sure. You know, there were we days when we didn't think we'd get through, but we did. And, you know, it's because we care at the end of the day, that's really what it is. No. But thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Erica, thank you. Thank you, guys. Good luck today. We'll see you soon, hopefully. Thank you. You too. Bye. All right. I will turn it over to uh, Rick for the IT budget. All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Uh, let's see. So on the first slide, Melissa, there you go. Thank you, Melissa. Um, the increase you see there is pretty marginal after the year, the really busy year that we had with COVID and 
the IT responses that we had to uh, address uh, remote, um, the workplace, uh, the, the voters situation, uh, we were all over the place. So the increase you see there is very minimal. Uh, we pretty much stayed within our allotment of, of funding. Um, as you see there, we're two full-time employees, it's Brett and I, and uh, we continue to push on, uh, push on with that uh, budget amount. Next slide, please. Uh, our focus is uh, for the upcoming year, as we've done last year, is the Cybersecurity Awareness Program uh, for our, our uh, employees, uh, which has gone very well. It actually has um, assisted us not being compromised. Um, it's just a level, uh, a layer of security awareness or in, secure, in cybersecurity that uh, we are going to be keeping probably for years to come. Um, the security levels that we have right now, we have some partners that really look at us from the outside. Uh, what we want to do in the upcoming year is really take a look internally and see how we are um, configured, uh, see what uh, better security measurements we could have. Um, the last uh, network storage solution that we had last year that we implemented, uh, there were security levels when we bought that, uh, security levels within that, uh, but is an internal process. Um, so we're gonna pretty much stay inside as well as keep an outside eye on us. Uh, security audits, uh, we're due for one uh, within the next year or so, um, which will really expose what, what little holes or have out there. Um, that third bullet is, it's been a long time. Uh, this is our final rollout of fiber optic build out, which is going to Simsbury Farms. Uh, this will help that uh, facility with uh, the town hall infrastructure, as well as dedicated internet access, which they have become, uh, not just with the, um, the parks and rec services, but also with the golf services and the pro shops and their online registrations. Uh, so they're, uh, uh, they're going to appreciate what's going to be happening there within the next three months. Um, and then the updated disaster recovery plan, which is constantly changing with all the types of technologies that are out there and security levels that we want to place. Next slide, please. Um, there's our increase for the budget. It's 5,447, pretty much with uh, salary, anticipated salary increases. Um, the 4,000 is the Zoom licensing. Uh, we were only had free licensing before the pandemic. Um, it blossomed with uh, Maria and Melissa and Amy. Uh, we got together and said, okay, you know what? We're, let's go out there and let's get some government licenses. And it was pretty much within the first quarter of the pandemic that we were pretty much, you know, licensed appropriately and using all licenses that we have. Uh, that amount covers the municipal licensing as well as uh, one license of webinar that we have, uh, which was put in force by social services. And then the um, cybersecurity awareness, there's a little uptick um, in their fees that's gonna be coming up. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, the CNR projects that are coming up, this is a new thing that, uh, that with um, Maria, Melissa and Amy, uh, we've put the hardware replacement refresh on a four year cycle, which we've never done before. It was pretty much a reactive on, okay, who's gonna get, uh, who's gonna get some equipment, who's gonna get the new software, so on and so forth. So this puts us on target for refreshing uh, our hardware base, and this covers town-wide, and uh, that number is like 42 devices a year. This also puts us into a position where if we, if we move to a virtual environment, those cost the expenditures that you see there will begin the process of virtualizing uh, the town desktops. Uh, right now, we're completely virtual on the server support side. Next slide, please. Projects that are coming up, uh, a really important one out there is the email uh, spam filtering and archiving for uh, 12,000. We've been engaged with a couple of vendors to date on that. Uh, we're looking to move um, within the next couple of months uh, due to the fact that uh, we're gonna be losing uh, that type of support uh, it's always been a shared service that we had uh, with the Board of Education, uh, but with their move uh, to the Google platform and 
their offerings there at Google for the educational community. Uh, we're put into a position where we, one, we took step one to migrate to an online cloud-based 365, which you know of, uh, which has helped us a lot. Um, and two is that we're going to have to try to, well, I didn't say try, but we're going to have to move to our own um, protection on email spam filtering and archiving solution as well. The project funding with savings from the 2001 network storage project. So I took a, you know, just like a squirrel hides his nuts. I took a little bit of uh, money in trying to get this project kickstarted for before this year is out. Um, I do have, I might be a little short, but, you know, I've talked to Amy and Maria and Melissa and, and we're all in agreement that we got to have this happen. Uh, so we'll, uh, we got fingers crossed and I think we could do it. Um, but that's a really important piece that we need right now. Next slide, please. Um, the upgrades for Microsoft Office. We're sitting at um, Microsoft Office 2010. We've been sitting there. We bought it actually in 2012. So we've been sitting there on uh, 2010 for a long time. And pretty much this is what we do with that desktop footprint. Um, so we want to go to 2019. We're already seeing some um, inconsistencies now that we're on 365 and we have an older version of, uh, of Office sitting on our desktops. Uh, so that'll be an important rollout for us and give us some more um, features and functionality uh, for all employees. Um, and that'll be a span of uh, two phases that we're going to have. And as it mentions right there, the library uh, with Lisa's pricings that she's gotten, it's been very uh, effective and uh, she's been rolling that out um, as, as funding is available and as licensing come up. Next slide, please. I got Rick. That's it. That's it. Great. You're ready to keep going. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. Yeah. Other no questions? Problem. Questions from the board? I have a question. Um, first of all, I just, as a 25 year IT professional, I, I find it amazing that it's Rick and Brett, is it? Yep. That managed the whole town's um, network, infrastructure, desktops. So um, very impressive. And I just had a question on the recycling of um, hardware. So are we, are we moving everybody to, or, or do, are they already on laptops with like docking stations? So everybody's can be, as we do the 42 transition, is that, is that where you're going? Everybody will have a laptop versus if people still have desktops? Um, no, we, we not, we're not looking at it that way. It's more of the administrative staff uh, pretty much has that option to go with the desktop and have the, the hubs with them so they could take the, the laptop home um, and then bring it back in the office. There's several admin now that do that, uh, which works okay. great. Um, on, the other, on the other side for your desktops, pretty much everyone below that is all desktop related. And those are the refreshes. Even the laptops that we have, Wendy, uh, with the the point with the whole COVID thing that that came upon us, we had to re-engineer a ton of laptops, and luckily we had them in our recycling bin. Uh, we pushed those out. So with the with the plan that we have, even those that we have, which I don't think are going to come back to us, I think you know remote working is going to stay with us. Uh, that we're going to have to refresh those as well. So to answer your question, we're going to have a mixture of desktops and laptops. Okay, so just my comment would be, is it something to look at that everybody, instead of replacing with a desktop, you replace with a permanent laptop for the person that is just more mobile? Just Yeah, we could definitely look at that for sure. I mean, there's a couple of folks out there um, that could benefit from that. Like Erica is one, you know? <laughs> no, really, she could... There, the way that office is pushing too in the state, uh, especially with the, the death certificates and everything, they're pushing a lot to the cloud. Um, so mm -hmm. to her, I have a mobile workstation would work, you know? Yeah. But okay. I will thanks. take a look. I will take a look at that. All right. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Eric. Uh, Chris. Uh, Chris. Hey, this, this is kind of, this is actually, Rick, you know, you're not on the hot seat here, brother. You can yeah. back up. Yeah, shut up. No. Um, it's, it's uh, just kind of 
conversational for the rest of us. And just some of the points you just made, and just something that Wendy just said, you know, um, I, I feel like there is a, it's not about the budget, sorry, but I'm taking time this morning. Um, I feel like there's a sense with, with, we have these ongoing updates about when town hall is going to reopen. We can, we continue to talk about that. We talked about it this morning about this, doing this virtually and all. And there is, I think there's this sense that every single person, once town hall reopens that everybody needs to be back in town hall. So I think you kind of know where I'm going with this. I, I hope that, you know, Maria, as we move forward as an organization next year, two years, four years, 10 years, whatever it is, I know it's easy to say this in the middle of where we are right now, but we know that Tecton's doing our plan for all of the facilities that we have. Um, and, you know, we're going to be thinking about, I'm sure that plan potentially as if what we just went through didn't happen. And we're gonna look at it through the lens of you gotta redo this building, the BOE needs its space, town hall needs its space, the police department needs its space, parks and rec needs its space, and I need these cubes, I need these offices redone, I need these desks. But I would encourage us at some point, whoever is responsible for this next year or five years, whatever it is, that what can we permanently deploy to a work from home scenario? I don't, I know just because we're a municipality, I don't want to think that we have to be, you know, we should be thinking about the evolution of the world and that will impact our budget going forward significantly. If we don't have to spend money to rebuild from a, structural standpoint and from an IT standpoint, if we don't have to just rebuild and replicate what we already have here on the ground. And it's not for today, but I, I hope somebody in town hall is potentially thinking about that and thinking that way. And that's a way to potentially save tax dollars. And I, I, I know that from my business, you know, I'm owned by a larger bank, the business that I run. There's no, you know, you'd be hard pressed. You'd be hard pressed to find a, a sector that wastes more space than the retail bank industry. It's just wasted space everywhere. But you know, there's a there's a corporate edict from my, I don't think anybody, my, my bosses are listening, um, but there's really a corporate edict that's coming down to say that through this, they've taught themselves that the world is different and they can work differently. And people want to work differently. You know, we need to ask our employees, do you want to work differently? Do you want to work in a different scenario? And they're managing to a 30 to 40% real estate footprint compression. That, that's massive. I mean, can you imagine the expense savings there? There's a whole bunch of tangential other things. Um, you know, so I just, I hope we're thinking about like that potentially in the future because that will come down to mill rate and think future budgets. Um, so my sermons there are done, it's just, just a comment. I hope that we're, we go down that path at some point. As no, we look to- yeah. Chris, thank you. That's that's a really fair point. And we're definitely thinking about, you know, those sorts of things. And, you know, I think to a certain extent, some of the services we provide, there's always going to be that sort of very in-person transactional nature, um, whether it's a state process that's driving that for us or right. But there are certain things that we have found that we can do do virtually. Um, and I think it's also to a little bit of, you know, changing expectations, right? We have, um, you know, some folks who, even though we can do many of our services virtually, they still want that ability to come into town hall in person. And, and we do hear that from time to time, um, whether it's because they just don't like to use technology, they they don't want to use technology. Um, but again, I think this pandemic has shown us that we can do a lot of what, what we need to do, we can still, you know, do from a remote location. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I, we, we hear I, you. <laughs> I, I, know, I, know, I, I know that we work differently to a certain extent in town hall, and there are certain functions that have to be interfacing. But I would push back on two statements you made. One is that, you know, some people like to come into town hall to get, that's not necessarily a requirement although of how we deliver services because we, it, it creates a certain environment. It, it, we may change the direction of way we deliver certain things. We've yes. got to evolve it. And yes. you know, I looked yes. at the BOE, the BOE is on the floor, the police departments and those are areas, I know the BOE, there's people that don't ever interface with the BOE staff, some, some of the BOE staff, excuse me, I wanna be clear, not all of it. But so there are places where you, you know, you have to ask why and how, and maybe make, you know, unique and new discomforting decisions that help you evolve. But thank you. Yeah, and I just wanna say, cause I think um, Rick sort of didn't give himself enough credit on this, but at the beginning of the pandemic, we were absolutely not 
set up to work remotely. I mean, a select few of us, you know, have had that ability because of the nature of our jobs. But I think the work that Rick and Brett did to adapt so quickly with no notice um, to deploy the amount of devices that they did um, was just amazing. So I just want to recognize that before we leave IT. Yeah, thanks for underlining that. Thanks, thanks Rick. Eric, thanks, guys. I can just um, Eric, Eric I, I would like to echo uh, what Melissa just said. Uh, it has been 12 months, Buzz, since you put me into Zoom timeout. And uh, um, I, I can't commend you guys enough for that. Uh, if, if you were not as forward thinking as you were and had the support uh, in town hall, we'd really be up a creek. So well done, guys. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. It was a team effort, believe me. There was a lot of chaos, but we got it done. Yes, you huh? did. Hey, Eric, this is Sean. Um, just on the on uh, on the the well stated sermon from uh, Reverend uh, Peterson there, and um, and the follow up <laughs> comments. And maybe this is a task for the technology task force for for the next budget cycle. But a, a real deep dive in pretending that we went virtual, not because we had to, because we want to, right? And what are the technological investments we need to make to not only facilitate that um, early on, and then um, also um, the the cybersecurity and, and and other changes that go with it. And I think I think that's an important discussion that we've been having um, and need to continue to dive into. But what does that look like so that we can start to, um, uh, I guess, quantify and, and with our eyes wide open, understand what that what's that strategic investment over the next two to five years, so that we deliver services um, the way we need to in the future, uh, both for the taxpayer and and for the individuals that need those services. You know. Um, right now, and again, Rick, no fault of your own, but you know, a department of two, you guys are are, are plugging the breach, as as Mike said before, right? And how do we want to change this to to again to to Chris's to Chris's well well worded point before of assuming we went virtual with ninety percent of the services, what does that look like from a technological spend? What does that look like from a security spend? Um, and we have we have a long history of spend to save in this town. And I think if those numbers work out where you are spending early to save in the future, whether it be staffing costs, delivery costs, or being able to have more capacity so that we don't have to add um, more employee costs down the road, I think that's really important. You know, Amy's office just did that um, with with the the finance software, right, that we're implementing, Amy, so that, you know, you're going to be able to deliver more to the employees um, and, you know, the finance department and the auditors and us more quickly, right, instead of investing in more staff to do what technology can put at your fingertips. So let's continue to drive at that. And, um, you know, I, uh, so that when we get to the next budget time, um, maybe there's a, a five-year plan from a, an IT capital spend standpoint. And I know Maria and Amy are looking at all that but maybe a, a, a more bold effort in terms of, hey, we want to spend 100000 here because we think over the life of this, it's actually going to save us 300000 in delivery costs or something like that. So, no, Well taken, uh, Sean. And yeah, you're, you're right on target for that. Uh, the technology that we buy, um, I've been doing this for, I don't know how many years now, but you know, everything we buy is pretty much, we keep in, how many full-timers do we have? Can we manage it? And knowing that we may not get a person, it's like, okay, can we manage those services? We've all, we've, we've pushed a lot out uh, for consulting and whatnot. Um, and we do have some money coming up, I believe, uh, for an audit and whatnot, just to kickstart the whole thing. But you're right, uh, those audits come back. It's gonna show that we're gonna need to do a couple other capital projects to protect it, to move Thank forward. You. Thank you. Also, next time, wear that hat behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna actually <laughs> come back at three thirty and liven us up with that hat, please. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? All right, Rick. Thank you very much. All right, thank you guys. They work. All right, we're gonna turn things over, I believe, to Amy for finance. Head into the world of finance. All right.
Um, so just starting with the overall budget, the finance department um, overall budget is a little over a million dollars and a 6.44% increase. As you can see by the slide in front of you, the majority of that increase relates to the finance department itself with about a 10% increase, which is a little misleading and I'll explain to you why um, in a couple of slides. So the area, the main areas of focus um, continue to maintain our AAA bond weight rating and adequate reserves. Um, so as you know, the last bond rating that we had, um, our advisor um, that conducted the rating actually said that there's a lot of towns being downgraded, especially during the pandemic. So the fact that we were able to maintain our AAA bond rating is definitely something we wanna to continue to strive for, especially as um, unknowns and economic times change. Um, continue to implement our financial management system, our new software, super exciting. Um, we did have to put it off a little bit due to the pandemic. Um, our um, implementer was no longer able to come out. So we kind of had to transition to the virtual environment. So hopefully we will have a full implementation by October 1st. Um, continue to implement procedures to address the auditor's management comments. As of today, I am so happy and relieved to report that we have positive pay. This has been something that has been years coming that we could not do with our previous software and Simsbury Bank, they just did not um, integrate well together. Um, so knock on wood, we have been okay to this point, but now um, that is something that really does lead to some sleepless nights. So I am very, very excited that that is now um, up and running. And Sean, I fully expect you to report that out to your father. Um, continue to review policies and procedures for quality, effectiveness, and efficiency. So just making sure that we are staying up to date on our policies and procedures, making sure that they're not getting stale. We always have best practices, things of that nature. Um, of course, continue to maintain our collection rate and then continue to value property fairly and in a timely manner. And that's again, something that I'll discuss later on in the presentation. So some of the budgetary highlights. So although it looks like there's a $22,000 increase in the finance department, this is the increase due to the sh shared services um, with the Board of Education. And then there is a revenue offset by the Board of Education um, to offset some of these dollars. So one thing I just wanted to note here, and I'm sure you all are well aware and you've heard it multiple times, but I do just want to continue to put it out there that because we are sharing services now, Although the town side of the budget reflects an increase, the Board of Edges, the Board of Education's budget shows a decrease. And the overall town savings is about $150,000 due to those shared services. Um, and then there's also an increase in my budget for about $9,700 um, for some part-time salary. So we do have an anticipated retirement coming up within the first few months of the next fiscal year. And we'd really like to be able to have some overlap training for a smoother, trans smoother transition. These funds were already budgeted into um, the town manager's budget for this fiscal year because somebody went out and had a beautiful baby. Um, so we're just reallocating those, um, those dollars from the town manager's budget to the finance department's budget. Mm -hmm. Um, there is another increase, about $8,600 due to our um, new accounting system. So last year, we were able to take a credit on our old accounting system, which reduced last year's expenditures. Um, but now this year, we are able to utilize that credit and it is the first full year of our new accounting system. And then um, the $10,000 increase in the assessor division um, just relates to the um, general wage and the con contractual step increases. Everyone in that department is fairly new um, in their position. So all employees in that department are eligible for both wage increases as well as step increases. So that's. Um, onto the CNR project. This is obviously an ongoing continuing um, CNR project year over year. You've seen it um, for the past several years. We are in fiscal year 22 appropriation of $60,000 and um, we will be expected to have one additional appropriation for $60,000 um, in fiscal year 23 to complete um, the funding for the $300,000 reval for the 20, 2022 grant list. And then the last slide, I know our assessor wanted to be here to speak to this, so I will do the best I can. Unfortunately, she is out due to a family emergency, um, but we are requesting some temporary staffing um, for the assessor's office. 
Um, we would like to have somebody assist the um, assessor with some field work backlog, um, conservative estimate of about 2,500 parcels and um, begin the data collection and preparation for the 2022 um, reval. So as you know, we do have a contractor right now that does some of our field work services and the contractor is actually doing an excellent job um, finding new growth. So Maria shared at her presentation at your last meeting um, that thus far we had spent say $9,400 in contracted services and we found over $100,000 in new growth revenue. Um, there is additional growth that is um, anticipated due to the contractor services. So the contractor has been able to find the growth, but we have not had the staff to be able to um, input the growth into our system. So there is literally a pile of um, properties, if you will, that the contractor has found that need to be adjusted that are still not into the system. So this position would be something similar to what the contractor is doing, except this position would be able to take the process from start to finish. So they would be able to take it from finding it all the way to implementing it into the system and then also taking what the contractor is finding and put that into the system as well. Um, I did ask Francine if it's something that we could have the contractor do, but um, as far as rates go, it would be a lot more expensive to have the contractor do that. So we don't want to have the contractor doing the data entry related to that. Another project that we would like the temp position to take part in is completing a full reconciliation between the permit system and the assessor system to see what is missing. Um, so the permitting system that we previously had um, did not talk to the assessor system. And this is something that is cleaned up with a new permitting system. But since the last system didn't talk to it, then in the assessor's office, everything had to be manually input. So there is probably some things that need some, some tweaking and some reconciling. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, okay. So some of the benefits of this, um, as you can see for your screen, we'd be able to complete a thousand fields inspections based on the permitted work. We're estimated to increase the grand list by 15 million and we're estimated to increase tax revenue by 557,000. I personally feel like that's a conservative estimate just based on that one example that Maria had given you related to what the contractor has found. And then some other benefits to having this temporary help um, is capturing the growth faster. So some, not all of the growth would be caught during a full reval process. But when Maria showed you that slide under the revenue and you could see that the reval years were spiking up and down, up and down, um, so this will allow that line to be um, not flat, but it won't be as much of a spike as you would see in a regular reval year because the work would be going would be ongoing. And then that leads us to um, reduced future reval costs. So everything um, is being maintained. So if we get the temporary help, we get everything in the system, we get in a good place where we should be, and then we are just basically on maintain we would only have to do a partial reval every five years, which would reduce our um, reval costs. Since right now we do one every five years and then we do a full one every 10 years, we would just have to do the partial because we're maintaining what we have on a regular basis instead of being behind and, and relying on that full year reval to capture anything that we've missed. Um, I think that is all I have. Yep, so if you have any questions. I have a question. Oh, right. go ahead. No, go ahead. When are you first? Yeah, my question was just to conf to reiterate, I guess, um, Amy, if we approve that service improvement for the um, assessor, it's mm -hmm. going to generate um, about $550,000 in additional revenue. So when we look at those later, right, today, whatever, um, we, well, you will show us that, that it's not going to hurt the mill rate at all if we increase add this person, it will actually alleviate some where else, right? Yeah. Okay, so that that will be good to see. Mm -hmm. um, and then the only other comment, I'm not sure if it's appropriate here, because Maria mentioned, you know, we've been monitoring the, um, you know, the grand list, and how, you know, we kind of were off this year. Um, looking forward, are we going to be better able to project out the years to come? 
I mean, that's definitely more of a Francine question, but I can tell you every single year when we're doing our tri board planning and I ask her for estimates, I always get the groan um, because it's so hard for her to project. She can only give us what she knows about. And I know for this year in particular, um, she said that things are closing at a very fast rate compared to what they have in the past, whether it be good weather or whatever. So say a six month, uh, a house would close out in six months. Um, you know, it's closing out in four months. So we're capturing that growth sooner than what we had anticipated. Um, there's also some stuff that had come down the pike that she just didn't know about. And then there's also, um, you know, the stuff that the contractor's finding, stuff that they're following up on. Um, the majority of this year was new growth, um, not the stuff that has been quote unquote found. Um, so, I mean, I can always follow up with her, but the fact okay. that we do it so early in the process I, I'm honestly not sure. I mean, she can only okay. know based on what she knows about. I just want to just one more con confirmation. If, if, and when we add in these additional services to look at this year, we'll include that revenue. So it will change the picture. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if we would include it all just because of the timing. So the person would have to actually come in to start the work. And then, so we'd probably capture some of that savings on the back end, and then the majority would be for the next year. Um, but yes, we would definitely offset the cost of the. the okay, All right, mm -hmm. thanks. Just to build upon that, so um, it would show as an increase in our budget, right? But it gets it gets offset in in the town's budget, and our budget being the board of selectmen budget side, right, Amy? So that 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 fifty five hundred dollars is not budgeted for in the current fiscal year. So that's an increase year over year. Right. Right. That 55,000 is not budgeted for. Right. So just again, from a straight line basis, it's going to contribute to a, a third of a percent increase roughly in the board of selectmen or a quarter percent increase in the board of selectmen budget. But in the overall hundred million dollar town budget, it's not going to contribute to a tax increase. Exactly. It right. won't affect the mill rate. Right. Um, and then, so thank you to, to you and, and Maria um, Melissa, Francine, you know, this is pretty startling that there are that many, and, and I'll, I'll say it directly, misses um, in the last decade in terms of, of the chewing up of the assessor card to the building permits. You know, I mean, this is, this is lost revenue for the town of Simsbury. Um, and, you know, the sad part is, is we're going to pick up a half a million but you know, if, if it goes back a couple of years, we've lost millions of dollars in revenue as a result of this process not having been implemented correctly um, for a long time, right? And uh, again, I know you and you, Amy and Maria are being very diplomatic here, but this is particularly troubling, um, especially when I heard about it the first time because there was an audit done um, in, in, in my earlier terms on making sure that the building permits were coming over to the assessor's office, because that was a gap that was identified by the auditors years ago. Um, and it's, it's particularly troubling that prior folks, um, we'll leave it at folks, um, didn't take nor raise the flag that this wasn't getting entered into the system. So Thank you again for doing this. I'm trying to, to stay on the positive side, but as a member of this board for a decade, I can't help but be pretty damn frustrated here that, that there's been a substantial amount of lost revenue from the town. And yes, it gets picked up to some extent in reval, but not entirely, right? Because if folks don't let you in um, or the cards aren't updated, then it can perpetuate. And we've all heard stories, right, Jackie? I think you and I have talked about this, where folks have built pools, um, <laughs> used them, and then filled them in and their taxes have never changed, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, that's, that's again, I'm not looking to, to, to raise taxes on folks, but when you improve your property, there's a tax component that goes with it. And that's a good thing for everybody. The value goes up, et cetera. Um, but this is a substantial shortfall that I can't help but commend, once again, Amy, you and, and Francine and, and Maria for catching and filling in. And again, for folks at home or otherwise that wonder why we have professional management, this is why we have professional management. This is another beautiful example of it, and it's not to knock anybody else in the past, but this is what professionals bring to the table um, as we run a hundred million dollar municipality. So I, I think it's really important that, that we remember that here. And, and when we get to debating our budget later, 
you know, again, this 55 is going to show up as an increase, but it's not right. So um, thank you again, Amy and Maria for this. You're welcome. And I will definitely pass on those kudos to Francine because this is the majority her. She is very um, detail oriented. She is the one that is digging into everything. She's paying attention to the MLS. She's seeing the discrepancies. So I will give all due credit to Francine on this one. Thank you. Yeah. And just to follow up on, on one, one of your comments. So we will see less gyrations in the um, reval. <laughs> but not an elimination, right? Because there's still the, the, the repositioning right. of overall home values. Yes, exactly. I'm not talking about here, right? But this is, you do your kitchen, you add a pool, you would do an addition. There are, you know, off cycle improvements to your house. This is what we're talking about. But the overall, your street goes up in 10% value or down 10% is still going to happen as part of the reval process, right? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Hey, I, I, Amy, I just wanted to add that if, if anybody is going to uh, be off on the estimates that they provide us early in budget season, I would much rather be off in the direction that she was off. Um, and I understand the conservative nature uh, of the estimates that she was making. And honestly, it's, um, it was a very pleasant surprise when we found out. Um, are there other questions for Amy? Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, we'll turn it over, I believe, to Maria for the town manager's budget. Yeah, great. So Melissa and I are going to do this one together. Um, Melissa, do you want me to drive the slides or would you like to? I can do it. I have it right here. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so our um, budget uh, this coming year will have a small decrease. Um, as Amy mentioned, that's really just an accounting change. Um, and we shifted some um, temporary um, funds, or excuse me, some funds for temporary staffing um, from our budget over to Amy's budget since she has that upcoming retirement. And again, so some anticipated um, salary increases for staff. Um, also, in terms of budget highlights, uh, we reallocated some funds from our advertising account. Um, we've been really working on modernizing our recruitment um, methodologies and procedures and are using um, less of sort of print media, some traditional forms of print media and had some savings there. So we took a portion of those savings um, and reallocated it to special activities. Overall, there were still savings, um, but again, took some of those savings reallocated to special activities for some things that weren't really being budgeted or captured prior to the pandemic. Um, again, some expenses associated with things like budget workshop day, um, some expenses associated um, with staff events and, and, and those sorts of things. And again, sort of anticipating that most likely in this upcoming fiscal year, we're going to start to see a return to normal. Thought it was appropriate to make sure that we are budgeting for those expenses and took advantage of the savings in the advertising account to be able to do that. So general government, um, this particular budget, you may recall, it's a little bit of a catch-all. It's for some of our centralized accounts that serve departments townwide, um, whether it's tuition reimbursement for all of our staff, our copiers, um, our telephone um, service, um, organization-wide training and development, postage, and so it's, it's things of that nature. And um, the sole increase here is um, we found that we were charging the Parks and Rec Department as a whole for their phone service um, through the revenue fund as opposed to the general fund. Um, the only department that we felt was really appropriate for that to be the case is the enterprise fund. So the sewer department does pay for its own phone lines, but you know, for example, saying that the phones out at the parks garage, um, is that really a revenue fund expense? We, we didn't think so. So we did reallocate that expense um, from the revenue fund to the general fund. So it's not a new expense, but again, an accounting change in terms of where we're reflecting that expenditure. Uh, for the community services uh, budget, um, this is, again, a little bit of a, of a catch-all budget. So this um, includes things such as um, the salaries and, and wage payments we make to some of our commission clerks, legal notices, um, dues to various membership organizations such, such as CCM, um, as well as our public agency grants. 
So um, the public agency support, you may recall that over the last few years, we've really done our best to consolidate where these are being reflected. So we have a better um, sense of how many agencies we are in fact supporting. So the um, Board of Selectmen slash Community Service uh, budget does reflect all of our public agency grants um, with the exception of a small number that are reflected in the social services budget. And then our contribution to Main Street is reflected in our economic development budget. And um, we do have a um, relatively modest increase for the North Central EMS Council. Um, that is based on a per capita fee. It's very similar to the health district. So we're billed on a per capita basis. So that's the driving um, factor in that particular request. Uh, we received two new outside agency requests for the, the upcoming year from Gifts of Love and A Promise to Jordan. And then we also had uh, three agencies request, uh, excuse me, request increased funding. Um, that being SCTV, the Chamber, and Meals on Wheels. Um, we have flagged um, the outside agency requests for you for your policy discussion at the end of the day. And I think we've done a nice job um, for the afternoon of summarizing, uh, again, what those differences are, and then you know, helping you to work through um, what, if any, of those requests you would want to fund. All right, Melissa, you want to take it from here? OK, thank you. You're welcome. So the next um, item is the health um, budget. And of course, this is our contribution for the Farmington Valley Health District. Um, the proposed per capita cost for member towns is increasing from $6.50 to $7. And this is actually in the midpoint of the um, projected range of increases that was originally presented in their strategic plan. So when they presented their strategic plan to us, they were projecting $6.90 to $7 dollars and 10 cents. So this falls right in the middle there. Um, that is about a, I believe a 7.7% increase in the per capita, but our population did increase again. So for us, this is looking like a 9.5% increase. So this budget, um, oh, I did want to note that this budget assumes that the state per capita funding will be um, $1.76, um, which falls short of the statutory contribution that the state is supposed to be providing of $185. Um, the state has not fully funded the per capita grant in, in several years. So I just wanted to note that on the revenue side. So the major drivers for this budget are prim primarily personnel costs. Uh, there was a new hire that um, actually was onboarded early due to the pandemic and was um, funded this current year through grant funding, uh, but we will have the full-time uh, salary for that person included next year, and that is consistent with the strategic plan. And the second primary driver I would point to is um, their office expansion. Prior to the pandemic, um, the, the office space wasn't sufficient already. Um, people are doubled up in offices. They have absolutely zero storage space. So um, that was a, um, a big need that they had that is being accommodated through this budget. So I just wanted to remind the board, um, there is one more year in the strategic plan. So next year for fiscal year 23, we will see um, costs associated uh, with the strategic plan, including the accreditation costs, which have been put on hold basically during the pandemic as all of the health district's resources have been going to COVID response. I don't know if we want to take questions on health now or at the end. Why don't we um, open it up? Are there questions for Melissa? Just a quick one. This is Sean. Melissa, any any revisiting for um, and, and again, I know the health districts are driven by by the state, but any revisiting of of the allocation of services, the breakdown of employees. I mean, again, the scope of what the health district has to offer is already very robust. Um, but, you know, the last year, I'm sure, has given us a lot of lessons learned. Um, is it too early for that conversation or, or um, as we build or as you build out the next five year plan, is that where it's going to come in? Sorry. So what's the question? Is it on staffing or just in staffing and how, you know, the expectation of I thought there was 10 points of service, like if I remember correctly. Right. And the reality is the funding levels only allow for a certain level of that. So are we revisiting that or is there a discussion at the, at the health district level to revisit how and, and what we're being asked to, or you're being asked to do as a board there? Yeah, I, that's an interesting question because I think, you know, when they laid out the five-year plan, they, the, the message they were driving home was, wow, they're very good at the regulatory stuff that they have to do. Yeah. Um, the sort of community health aspect of what they do is where they really need to invest. And that was part of the goal of accreditation. And I think it's become even more evident with, with the pandemic. So I think 
yes, the short answer is yes. I mean, the, the, the investments that we're looking at moving forward, I think are, will be to address those things. And that was part of the plan to begin with. So. And then any, I appreciate that answer. Any, any word on, on, is the state revisiting the funding formula, the composition of health districts? Do we, do we know? Um, because again, I'll continue the negligent uh, bandwagon here. You know, it, it seems pretty negligent that the state is not funding the obligated amount for the health district, given the year we've been in. Um, and if there's no plans to address that, then it, it just further perplexes me. Um, but a, any talk of what's going on at the Capitol with respect to health districts? Yeah, I know that the, the health directors in the state are really advocating for more direct support. I mean, not only the per capita, but in terms of grant funding, everything that's been coming down to, to the health districts and health departments is from the CDC. So big chunk of grant money that the health district got this year and is planning for next year is the CDC grant, and it's not from the state of Connecticut. Um, it comes through the state from the CDC, but there is no direct funding directly, um, direct grants from the state at this point. So it, I, I know that's been a source of frustration. Um, I know we had a conversation about FEMA and how, you know, while they are eligible for reimbursement from FEMA, that is not the most effective um, funding source for them. I mean, what really, what they need is direct support, you know, to be able to address the needs quickly. So um, I know that's been a source of frustration. Yeah, and, it, and it's an example of, of the duplicative nature of government, right, is if we're all applying for FEMA resources all over the place, health districts on top of that, we're wasting, you know, thousands of hours of staff time when it should be centralized and then, you know, managed appropriately, right? And, you know, I, I liked the, the, the discussion we had in terms of the town can apply and then reimburse perhaps the health district or the state could do it. You know, I, you know, again, it needs to be centralized. And then I'll also couch my comments with the last time the state looked at this, our contribution was going to go from 150,000, I think, to a million dollars because they just made up a formula um, and nobody that knew what they were talking about was involved in the discussion. So I know that was something Tom Cook and I had had, had concerns about years ago. So. Um, if, if you, if you as a board member and Jeff as a board member need advocacy from this board or connections to the legislators, you know, I think that's important to bring up through our normal course of communication. Okay. Thank you. Um, Eric, this is Mike. Um, I would, uh, share Sean's concern. Um, I also, uh, cannot give kudos enough to the health district. Um, as one of the official old folks, um, I, I got uh, my first half of my vaccine this week and uh, looking forward to getting a second shot. But the, the, the work that the health district has done to protect the residents of the Valley in Simsbury has just blown me away and makes me real proud to be a part of it. And you guys deserve all our support, which I know you get from Simsbury, but uh, the state has been borderline negligent and not backing up what they set up. And, uh, um, and I would also encourage you, uh, Chris's comments were very good about looking at more decentralized office space and stuff. Maybe it doesn't work for you, but as, as part of your strategic plan, I would really encourage you to look at that to make sure your system both works, but also uh, works going forward because the world is changing, <laughs> whether we like it or not. But thank you from the, my perspective, all the health district has done. They've been wonderful. Thanks, Mike. Other questions from Melissa? All right, all yours. All right. So moving on to areas of focus for our office. Um, of course, we're going to continue to coordinate our response to COVID-19. Um, a lot goes into that and, you know, communicating with the public, um, planning for the reopening of town buildings, and of course, managing all the day-to-day -day matters within our workforce. We will continue to support the work of the EDC. We are continuing our business visitations, although they are virtual for now. Um, the marketing project, the updating of the branding materials that um, is now underway. So we're very excited about that project. We will continue to um, negotiate um, collective bargaining agreements for those that are expired or will be expiring. We've got three CSEA contracts that have expired and we have the um, IBPO contract, which is for the police officers and that is coming due uh, this June. 
We'll continue to work on our long range capital planning. Of course, you've um, you know seen the parks and open space master plan as well as the presentation you had on the facilities master plan and we'll continue to incorporate data from both of those plans into our capital budget so that we can refine our, our baseline needs moving forward. And also um, looking to advance your goal to foster an engaged high quality workforce. As you know, we're working on um, taking a look at our existing policies and procedures uh, with an equity lens and making updates and revisions as necessary. So we'll continue to keep you updated on that project. Moving on to insurance. Um, this is tab 19 in your budget book. Our budget indications from KERMA uh, for liability, auto, and property, as well as workers' compensation are at a 3% increase. And I know Maria addressed this in her original budget presentation to you all, but we did um, reallocate a portion of our LAP and workers' compensation insurance from the Parks and Rec Special Revenue Fund um, back to the general fund. Um, we did some digging um, to really look at the figures more closely to see <laughs> what we were budgeting for those figures in the revenue fund and make sure that it was appropriate. Um, so we made adjustments um, following that analysis. Um, you'll recall we did this last year with the WPCA. It actually worked out in the opposite direction so that we were end up, ended up charging them um, a little bit more um, and it was a net savings to the general fund. But in this instance, um, the adjustment worked out in the other direction. So this budget does also include the new premium for our cybersecurity policy. Um, and we do split that policy, um, the premium on that policy with the Board of Education. Any questions on that one? Hey, Melissa, it's it's Chris. And guys, I'm I'm here. I just want to, I, the my iPad is it's futzing around and not charging, so I'm trying to just turn the camera off to save um, uh, battery power. But hey, just anecdotal. Um, you know, I used to be on the insurance committee. Um, and, you know, for my fellow insurance nerd, um, Sean Askin there, uh, just for our education purposes, the, you know, how, how did the, how overall, or maybe most, how did the uh, health insurance um, utilization and claims perform so far this year? Because across the board, more, most industries, um, claims are down, utilization is way down. Um, and uh, I'm not looking for that to be any sort of reasons why we would change something moving forward, especially with self-insured plans like ours and such have really have had significant uh, uh, favorable performance. And so do you have any just maybe update us because we don't ever talk about insurance, um, uh, you know, actual to expected results? That's a, that's a great segue. <laughs> We're gonna, I think, help address that in this in this next slide. And if I don't okay. answer what you're looking for, let, let me know. But um, yeah, so we, right, we are, um, you know, self-insured for our health insurance fund. Um, considering where we were just a few short years ago, our fund is in an incredibly um, improved and stable position. Um, so for this coming budget cycle, we're actually recommending no budgeted increase um, for the health insurance fund. Um, we are projecting um, the health insurance fund balance to be at 42% of expected claims for fiscal 21-22. Um, you know, as a reminder, I, I did want to share for folks that we do not carry aggregate stop loss um, for our fund. We do carry uh, individual stop loss on, on claims, but we do not carry an aggregate stop loss policy. So, you know, as a result of that, it's just really important for us to be disciplined and make sure that we're maintaining a healthy reserve um, of at least 25% of expected claims um, to essentially be the equivalent of, of fully insured. I will be honest, you know, from a comfort level, I think uh, 30 to 35% is a little bit more of a sweet spot for us. You know, I've been doing this work for a long time with shared, you know, um, self, um, shared services, self-insured health insurance pools. And every once in a while you get those outlier years, which for whatever reason, you might get an unusual amount of outlier cases. And, you know, that 30 or 35% can, can get whittled at uh, pretty quickly. Um, you know, due to the uncertainty, though, that, that we are having this year um, related to COVID, I think, you know, we feel most comfortable at a staff level and as well as our employee benefits consultants that while 42% is a little higher than normal, um, just around the uncertainty with COVID, um, keeping uh, the fund um, reserves at, at that point for the upcoming year. And we did see, Chris, to your question, 
Um, we did temporarily see a decrease in our claims due to the pandemic. Um, particularly for us, it was during the lockdown period and really sort of that summer afterwards. What's really interesting, um, and our benefits consultants do a monthly claims analysis for us, um, is we saw a bit of a return to normal in terms of utilization, particularly for routine professional services. Um, quite a bit more quickly than a lot of our municipal counterparts. We're, we're not really quite sure um, why, but, but that was the trend. Um, so again, our utilization is, is a bit at more of a, of a return to normal, if you will. Um, and uh, we did see, again, that deferral of preventive care and elective procedures uh, in sort of spring, summer of 2020 are, are you know, more on track at this point. Maria, are we considering on aggregate stop loss before? And we stopped it or remind me the history on that? You know, I'm not sure the history of it. You know, generally speaking, um, advice I've had from, you know, benefits consultants in the past is that, again, if we are being disciplined about maintaining a healthy reserve, um, the aggregate stop loss is often a very costly and somewhat unnecessary expense. I think if we were maybe a little more risky and had more of a risk tolerance and, um, you know, we're comfortable with a much lower reserve, I would say, yeah, absolutely. You know, aggregate stop loss makes, makes a lot of sense here. Um, but again, I think that because we are now budgeting appropriately uh, for the reserve, um, you know, we can take a look at it and, and check in with them again on it, but it's probably an expense that we might not necessarily really need to take on. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Okay, I appreciate yeah. that, thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions on health insurance? I mean, this is great news. I mean, honestly, right? When you think about where we were a few years ago with the fund being insolvent and, you know, we weren't collecting enough uh, in premiums from either, you know, us as the employer, or the employees to cover expected claims like this. This is just tremendous. And, and again, I know when we came up with our plan to sort of get us into a better position, we had sort of a low end of the range, a mid middle part of the range or a high end of the range to plan for. We went with sort of the mid level of, of what was expected and, you know, things things worked out really well. So, um, again, much, much improved and stable position. So very good news to report here. Good, thank you. Great, all right, thanks. Okay, switching gears, I'm gonna cover the CNR project that's under general government. And this is for the public safety radio system maintenance and repairs. Um, so this is a new program related to the new public safety radio system. This is actually, this will be different than um, the annual maintenance costs, which will be incorporated starting um, in the fiscal year 23 operating budget. Um, we are making good progress on this project and we should be up and running on the new system this spring. Um, so this program is to address the upgrade repairs and inspections on the shared infrastructure that we have with the fire district. So we signed an MOU with the fire district on this topic and we agreed to, um, to split any mutually agreed upon costs 50-50 uh, on the shared infrastructure. So the way it works is some of the infrastructure is theirs, some is ours, and some is uh, shared, which is how we were able to realize so much savings with this project. Um, so under the MOU, the fire district will let us know um, of, the, of any planned um, repairs or upgrades that need to happen in the upcoming fiscal year. They'll let us know by mid-January so that we can incorporate it into our capital plan. Um, so that's that's what this program is. So you'll see this um, ten thousand um, dollars in each year of the plan to address you know any needs that come up related to the shared infrastructure. Questions on that? Okay. Yeah, you're good, Melissa. Thanks. All right. Great. Thanks, Melissa. And then uh, lastly, under our budget, we're going to talk about the Meadowood acquisition, um, just because this touches so many departments, right? It touches planning, engineering, our office, uh, recreation. We've been capturing the potential Meadowood acquisition under general government uh, and the capital plan. And um, based on um, an update regarding the status of some of the grants that we were hoping to receive for this project, um, it is looking as if our potential acquisition costs, if we were to proceed, uh, may increase upwards of around $228,000 in terms of uh, above and beyond what we had initially been planning for. Um, again, this would be for the purchase and improvement of 288 acres um, with open space 
uh, and walking and hiking trails, um, preservation of the historic barns and signage related to the time that Martin Luther King Jr. spent there, um, preservation of agricultural land, as well as the 24 acres um, that we would purchase outright with no deed restrictions for most likely potential future use of uh, multi-purpose athletic fields, but for the time being, it would just remain open space. Great. Thanks, Melissa. So this is um, a projection of, again, what our updated acquisition costs would look like. So uh, potentially one funding model would be to remain our acquisition bonding cost of 2.2 million and, and keeping that piece flat. Um, and then again, if the um, grants do not come through as we had initially anticipated, if we do need those funds up to $220,000, you know, there could be conversations around you know, do we want to maybe split that between the general fund and capital fund reserves equally? So maybe about $114,000 from each of those funds. Perhaps there's a comfort level from the board to do it all from the general fund or all from the capital reserves. But that, again, might be a potential um, funding source for us so we don't have to increase our borrowing. And then again, there were about $87,000 in miscellaneous expenses uh, related to the acquisition of, of that, um, such as the environmental review, um, there's a current appraisal underway that the Board of Finance has requested, um, some signage, some modest parking improvements we would do, et cetera, to the site. And that would be paid for through the bonding. Our estimates um, with this updated information about the status of our grants, um, an estimated range of the town's cost per acre might be somewhere uh, to the tune of say $8,400 to $8,700. So still um, very modest compared to some of our other large acquisitions that were uh, closer to 25 or 30,000 an acre, or in the case of the triangle and present value dollars, it was over $50,000 an acre, the town's contribution. So again, still very, very modest in comparison. Um, we do have um, some other um, uh, barn restoration and demolition work um, that we do expect would be funded um, through grants and donations. And so what of an, you know, what type of an impact might this have on a, on a typical uh, you know, taxpayer in Simsbury? And so again, this is just approximation at this point, but it would be approximately $25 a year for 10 years or about $250 total in terms of a typical single family home and their contribution towards the acquisition. Um, and you know, we have also done some preliminary analysis and if the development were to be uh, built out as planned, the tax revenues that we would generate from the single family homes, we are estimating that would not be sufficient, not, honestly, just not even close to sufficient to cover the cost of educational and municipal services that would be needed to support the units and to support the development. So when you think about it, right, there's ongoing operating and capital expenses, both for educational as well as municipal services. And that would affect the mill rate sort of in perpetuity, if you will. Um, again, we'd be supporting um, various you know, infrastructure, um, you know, sending public safety services in. Again, there's the educational component. You know, statistics that we've seen are typically for a development of that nature, um, an estimated two school children per home. Um, in our estimates, to be conservative, we used about 1.7 school children um, per home being constructed, just again, to even be on the conservative side. And again, you know, we were finding that, um, again, the tax estimated tax revenue from those homes would not be sufficient to cover the cost of services being provided to those homes. Um, so I do think that's an important part of this conversation as we move forward. Great. Right. Any initial questions for us? And we will have a capital and CNR, you know, um, wrap up discussion this afternoon, but happy to take any questions that people might have at the moment. Other questions? Other questions? I just have a couple um, on, we're just talking about Meadowood, right? Cause we're gonna talk about it later. Um, but just a couple things I just wanted to highlight um, in the, the designation of the land, the 24 acres, you know, we've keep saying that it's sports fields but there's nothing saying it it's, has to be sports fields. Oh. Um, so I just think the public should know that, that we're not gonna have, you know, we, unless we need them over everything else, we don't aren't going to have six new soccer fields or cross fields. Um, and there is the option potentially for either affordable senior housing, starter homes, townhouses um, in that space, dependent on future needs of the town, right? Um, so that was 
just one thing. The other point I wanted to make too is um, for this open space acquisition, you know, will we have, or will we see increases in, um, you know, the maintenance of open space? Cause I believe right now we have, you know, we're, we're I don't know if I should say struggling, but we have enough open space to keep us busy without adding another large parcel of land. Right. Sure. Yeah, Wendy. So that's a really great question. And, you know, I think that the Open Space Committee um, did a lot of work this past year on their natural stewardship policy that they recommended to you all um, that you did endorse. Um, and again, I think that policy was fairly consistent with the practice of our um, of our parks department. And so essentially, you know, it's saying let our open spaces, let our forests, et cetera, be for us um, and to not do what's called active management of, of those spaces. Um, but you're right. I mean, let's say, for example, um, maybe we have a windstorm and some trees come down on a trail. Then, of course, yes, our park staff would go in and for safety reasons, they would, you know, remove those obstructions from from a trail or um, if there was some other sort of, you know, urgent uh, maintenance or, or emergency need that, again, was really safety related, yeah. that will go into that open space parcel and do some sort of work. Um, but again, as we're sort of envisioning our parcels moving forward, this sort of kind of active management, um, really stepping away from that. Um, and again, that helps too, to free up time for our park staff to focus mm -hmm. more on our areas that are for um, active recreation. So our, our parks that have fields and, you know, ball fields and things of that nature. Okay. Maria, to follow up on that, is it, it saying it another way, if we were to purchase it this year, there wouldn't be a, a rec employee request or a, a parks employee request in next year's budget because of Meadowwood, correct? Right, that's correct. And just in terms of uh, to give you an idea of service level, and I know that Tom T and Orlando are, are on the meeting with us, and they might like to jump in. You know, Memorial Field is a good example of active recreation, right? There's a skate park, and there's lots of fields, athletic fields, we have our day camp program up there during the summer. And, um, and guys, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe at a minimum, we have about two full time people up there. Um, you know, Monday through Friday um, during the growing season. Um, and so that's an example of sort of the resources that are needed for one of our facilities that's active recreation versus something like this, which would really be passive in terms of the walking and hiking, which would really just be occasional maintenance more because of a safety concern. Um, and I don't know, Tom or Orlando, if you have anything you might like to add to that. No, Maria, you, you were correct. But I, I, just to Sean's point about the, the uh, staffing request, the staffing requests we have in the budget and that we're in the master, the parks and open space master plan, those those are based on what we have now, not what potentially could be here four or five years in the future or, or longer. Mm -hmm. It's the, we're down two or three people now, not, you know, with the, with the additional six fields coming on board in, you know, the next decade or so. So, yeah. And just to add to that, Sean, a property like Meadowwood would only be maintained on, on an as need basis. You're talking if if we have for maybe an hour or two a month, if we do have any tree issues or things of that of that nature that would need to be addressed. Yeah, no, that that that's what I was thinking, and that's along the lines of what we've experienced with Ethel Walker, right, guys? You know, Tom, I agree with you. Notwithstanding the overall need in the department, but we didn't come in and say, "All right, we bought Ethel Walker, which is I think a larger parcel. We need to add two full-time equivalents." directly tied to it. When you step back and look at the open space need overall, um, and it's tied together, but not the same thing. We can continue to maintain at the level we are um, by acquiring this. Now it's a question of service levels and what we're asking your department to do, but it's a different philosophical question than you're going to definitively come in and say, yeah, I got to have a half or a full-time FTE next year directly linked to Meadowwood, right? You, your, your point is right. Yes. Yep. I'm not suggesting we continue to shortchange your department, that, uh, but it, it's it's a different philosophical discussion, right? We've got to we've got to address how do we want to maintain open space and parks and rec in this community overall, um, but that's separate and distinct from what we do here at Meadowwood. Correct. Hey, Eric. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sean. You said good. I just want to go back to that statement that Wendy made about utilization of that open, util in a, a sort of an open concept utilization of that space. Um, that uh, not necessarily something I would put out there as possible use would be um, housing or human occupied space for services, just because it, uh, to me, it goes against what we think about for the usages or the intent of forward thinking about those types of um, developments. You, you'd want to be 
closer to the centers of, uh, of culture and access and opportunity. And then it would also go against uh, how we open the conversation about anything other than passive would then increase cost and services. So it kind of goes against that premise of, um, just want to make sure that, that that position is also voiced and understood. Yeah, yeah and I'd like, I could just forward that, that the town is not in the business of developing parcels. So regardless of the direction we go, a developer would have to come in with a, with a plan that's fiscally backed, that's backed by an investment, right? So the town is not in the affordable housing development business or development business period. And, and I don't think we have any plans to be. Well, I was just going to say, we may not be here when that the, the need on that land happens, like us on the board today. So by leaving it not designated specifically for something until whatever the need is at the time occurs, um, that just leaves it open for that. No, I, I agree with you, but I just, we got to be careful in that we're not going to be leading the development of any housing on that property. That's not our capacity. Yeah. It's just, right? it's there for future potential use, whatever that happens to be when we probably won't all be here. Correct. Yep. Well, I'm planning on being here. Um, so I just want to do a quick time check. Um, it's been a couple of hours. Um, I think we're probably at a, a decent stopping point if we were to take a 10 minute uh, stretch break. Is this an okay time, Maria, or is there a little yeah. bit more that would be good to go through? No, you know what? It absolutely is. Um, okay. And again, not sure how we wanted to do it since we're doing it virtually today. If you wanted to try to take some structured breaks or just, you know, have people, you know, break when they need to. Um, so what, whatever your preference, Eric. Okay. Well, I was just going to recommend we, we could um, turn our cameras off for about 10 minutes, take a quick stretch, and then uh, come back at 11.05. Great. Sounds Does that work good. for the group? Okay. Great. Great.